Center. I'm the director of the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia at New York University. Uh, I'm joined by Elise Giuliano of the Harriman Institute at Columbia University, who will be co-hosting the event here to, with me today. This is what we call the, it's a jointly sponsored workshop between the Harriman Institute and the Jordan Center. The Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia at New York University. Uh, I'm joined by Elise Giuliano of the Harriman Institute at Columbia. Sorry. <laughs> um, this is a, a joint session that we run that's called the New York City Russia Public Policy uh, series. We've been doing this for about seven years now. The idea here is that we try to bring together a number of speakers on a pressing uh, contemporary issue of importance, combining scholars uh, with people with expertise in the area. Uh, and and we have been running these uh, now for about seven years. There, We are able to do this thanks to the very generous uh, support of the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Uh, the format for today, it will be as follows. Um, for those of you who've been with us before, we'll follow a similar format to what we normally use. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Elise in one second, and Elise will introduce each of our speakers in turns. We've asked each of our speakers to prepare some opening remarks. After the opening remarks, we'll open it up to question and answer. As this is a webinar, uh, we'll be using the Q&A function through the webinar. Most of you are familiar with that by now. But the very nice thing about the Q&A function is that you can ask questions at any time. So if while the speaker is talking, you want to throw a question in there, Elise and I will then choose from among the questions to pose to our speakers when we get to the Q&A portion of the, of the seminar. Those of you who are watching on YouTube, you can add questions in the YouTube comments section. Um, so without any further ado, it is my uh, great pleasure once again to welcome you to today's session, which is on Russia's rule in occupied Ukraine. And I'm going to turn it over to Elise to introduce the speakers. Elise. Okay, thanks, Josh. We will jump right in. Um, our first speaker today is David Lewis, who is professor of global politics at the University of Exeter and a senior associate fellow at the Royal United Services Institute in London. He's a specialist in international relations with a regional focus on Russia, Central Asia, and the Caucasus, and has published widely on the rise of a liberalism and authoritarianism in global politics, as well as on political de developments in Russia and Eurasia. I just want to mention that um, he has, among his other works, he has a, a forthcoming book entitled Occupation, Russian Rule in Southeastern Ukraine, um, and it will be coming out in September, uh, published by Hearst. David. Thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, great to be here today, uh, at least virtually. Um, I think uh, it's really good to see uh, a lot of interest in this topic. And I just wanted to start off in a way by trying to set out some of the important implications for uh, a focus on the occupation and Russia's occupation regime. I've been working on this for a little while now, um, particularly on the economic aspects of the occupation more broadly in writing this book. And sometimes it's been quite hard to explain, for example, to policymakers why the lived experience of the occupation is so important for understanding not just the humanitarian um, side of the conflict, but also the conflict itself. So I just wanted to uh, outline a few ideas about what it means for the war, what it means for the wider security environment in Ukraine and uh, indeed across uh, Europe potentially, um, and indeed what it means for Russia as well. This is uh, an extension, if you like, of the Russian state, and it tells us, I think, something about what Russia is and where Russia perhaps might be going. Um, so first of all, what does it mean for the war? I think there's, uh, for those of you, and I'm sure most of you have been following the war very closely, a lot of the attention has been on uh, the military analysis, rightly so, uh, and often a rather geopolitical uh, sort of view from uh, 35,000 feet down on the conflict. And I think it's really helpful actually to uh, refocus our attention often on the experience of those uh, living in the occupied territories. And of course, those uh, many millions of people who uh, fled the occupation and are therefore living in exile either in Ukraine um, or indeed further afield, either in Russia or in Europe, for example. Uh, and remember that when we talk about uh, all sorts of ways of managing the conflict, um, that we are also talking about the lives of these people uh, in these occupied territories. So, uh, for example, first, when you talk about any kind of de facto or indeed negotiated freezing of the conflict, it's important that that is not seen simply in the old sort of old fashioned way of drawing lines on a map. Uh, but that it effectively leaves millions of people uh, still living under uh, Russian rule um, in the newly annexed territories, 
a bit hard to find exact figures, but between three and four million people uh, still living there. And then millions more, uh, obviously, who have left, uh, lost their businesses, lost their livelihoods, often lost their homes uh, during this conflict. There's a large number of people who are affected by any kind of um, attempt to uh, produce some sort of um, uh, freezing of the conflict. Uh, so we should look at the uh, bottom up, if you like, approach to that, uh, which is just as important as the geopolitical uh, resolution. And then secondly, of course, any any kind of de facto um, uh, consolidation of this line and of this Russian occupation gives time for Russia to continue these campaigns of Russification and demographic change in the occupied territories. Uh, it gives Moscow more time to radically change these societies um, through education, through cultural programs, through this indoctrination in the media that I think we'll hear about in more detail uh, through the rest of our discussion. Uh, so I think that's a real sort of warning to take seriously uh, the existing lived experience here and make sure that when we talk about geopolitics, we take that into account. But on the other hand, when we talk about theories of Ukrainian victory, uh, I think they've also not always had a realistic view of what is going on uh, in these occupied territories. Uh, sometimes they've rather taken for granted that the vast majority of people uh, will welcome a liberation. Uh, we don't actually know what public opinion is like in many of these areas. It's often very varied. It's often in flux. And of course, we have different stages, if you like, of Russian occupation, ranging from Crimea annexed in 2014, de facto occupation in the so-called uh, Donetsk People's Republic and the People's Republic, and of course the uh, what we might call newly occupied areas uh, in Kherson and Zaporizhzhia Oblast. And these are all at different stages uh, of this Russian campaign of Russification, and therefore um, we have different um, potential uh, positions, but we do know that in parts of these areas, of course, you do have quite strong um, uh, political positions, including pro-Russian positions, that we have to take into account when we try to understand what a process of reintegration might look like. In that sense, of course, the occupation, in a way, is the most uh, sort of violent and coercive expression of this long-standing uh, discussion about Ukrainian state building, about Ukrainian political projects, uh, and indeed about Ukrainian identity and belonging. Uh, and I think we can't ignore those questions when we discuss this. And then finally, on that point about um, the uh, attitude of people in the occupied territories. I think we'll talk about uh, the very sensitive topic of collaboration later on, uh, but clearly uh, Ukraine's collaboration law, and we discussed the benefits um, and perhaps negative aspects of that, uh, clearly uh, puts many people potentially who are forced to cooperate with the occupation authorities um, in danger of facing the threat of prosecution. And that will also um, make reintegration more difficult, I think, going forward as well. So in short, without a proper understanding of the situation in these occupied territories and the different and very complex and varied situation across them, uh, it's very difficult really to devise a sustainable theory of victory uh, or indeed uh, devise a potential peaceful settlement of the conflict uh, that could prove to be sustainable. Uh, second big implication, I think, is, is just a little bit wider than that, to think uh, uh, a bit more about Russia as a security actor, uh, and indeed as an occupying power. Of course, goes without saying Russia doesn't acknowledge itself as an occupying power, rather the contrary, um, as uh, a liberator. Um, but of course, under international law, this is exactly an occupation, and all the aspects of international law uh, fit with it. But here, I think there's, um, you know, the bad news is that Russia, I think, uh, to be honest, has demonstrated that it is quite good at occupation. Um, it has lots of experience of dealing with hostile populations through military means, but it's also very effective, I think, at using non-military means, uh, the cultural campaigns, the propaganda, uh, particularly the economic and patronage networks that it builds up. Uh, it's very effective means of co-opting uh, local elites. And uh, broadly, although there is considerable Ukrainian resistance still that we might discuss, um, I suggest that at the moment, at least, uh, the level of resistance is probably manageable for the Russians. Um, and that gives us some important lessons about how effective Russia can be at implementing an occupation regime. Um, and we can ask ourselves the question of whether uh, in a uh, negative turn for the war, whether Russia could also implement that regime in other parts of Ukraine, for example. I think there's a couple of caveats to that. One is, uh, and again, I think we'll talk about this, I'm sure, as we go through, 
Russia's regime is very reliant on uh, co-opted elites. It has been very effective, I think, at engaging with local patronal networks. Occupation, of course, doesn't start from a tabula rasa, from a blank sheet. It uh, takes on the granularity of existing politics. Uh, many of those figures who now front the Russian occupation regime uh, were those who were already involved in politics and are using the regime as a way to revive their flagging political careers um, and, of course, to uh, find ways to uh, use the economic opportunities the, the occupation uh, regime allows as well. So there's all sorts of incentive structures in there that Russia is using to bring on board uh, co-opted elites. Um, and of course, there's thousands of people that, as the regime consolidates, become involved in its running. So we now have presidential elections coming up. There'll be thousands of people involved in those electoral commissions um, in uh, the process of uh, electing, of course, uh, Mr. Putin as president. Uh, and that, in a way, also produces this uh, local elite who are connected to the occupation regime. And then secondly, just on the, the sustainability question, uh, occupation is not cost free, um, but it's also not so expensive for Russia that it is unsustainable at present. Uh, Russia is spending around $10 billion a year in subsidies, in reconstruction programs um, across the four newly occupied territories. I think that's sustainable within the Russian budget, but of course, if uh, it tries to take on more territories, and particularly territories with potentially greater uh, challenges, uh, perhaps more resistance, uh, that would increase those costs exponentially. And I think at that point, the Russian state starts to look very much overstretched. So I think there's an interesting question about, uh, you know, a lot of people discussing whether Russia can, Russia can make a breakthrough in the war. Uh, very few people are discussing the extent to which Russia can sustain occupation in other parts of Ukrainian territory. And I suggest that actually it would face serious problems uh, potentially in doing so. And that, again, also goes to the much wider discussion about whether Russia poses a wider threat to uh, Europe um, and to Eastern Europe as well. Just briefly, a couple of points on what this might mean for Russia, because I think, again, uh, it's worth thinking about the occupied territories as a kind of laboratory for uh, Russia's own authoritarian system. Uh, what happens in occupation, and we know this from elsewhere um, in the world, often comes home uh, later on in the form of new authoritarian practices. Just as an example, we have the presidential elections, so-called, uh, coming up in Russia. And of course, they will also be run in the occupied territories. And there you see a, a kind of more extreme version of the already almost uh, uh, democracy-free process that's going on in the Russian Federation. Um, these are uh, particularly meaningless in, in one, one sense in the occupied territories, but they do show the ability of Russia to impose its presence across these territories. So they have that performative uh, element that's very important. But there's no campaign. None of the cam uh, candidates are really campaigning in the occupied territories. Uh, this looks very much like a kind of Soviet exercise uh, in ritualistic polling, uh, where the most important thing is the process uh, and not the content or indeed the result. And in all sorts of other ways, uh, these occupied territories are sort of reproducing a kind of exact Soviet future for Russia. Uh, the renaming of streets, not going back to the traditional Russian names, but to you know Karl Marx Street, um, uh, all sorts of Soviet names reappearing. Uh, Freedom Square in Mariupol is now Lenin Square again putting Lenin statues up again. It's a very strange uh, sort of sense of the future vision of Russia going forward. And then just finally, uh, we also have to think about the international uh, context. Uh, and here again, obviously occupation comes almost back onto the agenda of international relations and fits with this wider concern about major powers creating spheres of influence um, and coercively intervening in their neighboring, in their neighboring uh, regions. Uh, so this is not simply about Russia, it's also about the future of the international system and what a post-Westphalian system might look like. Uh, and the danger is, of course, that normalizing this occupation also normalizes it in other ways. But also, just finally, it raises the question about our own attitude towards occupation and international law over many years. Uh, inevitably, we get the comparison with uh, Israel's occupation of Palestinian territories, other uh, coercive military interventions around the world, by different powers. Uh, and our approach to international law in this case, I think will also obviously have an, in, an impact on uh, international law elsewhere and on the Russian narrative, Russia's ability to maintain a narrative that tries to normalize this occupation in the future, 
by essentially saying, well, might is right, uh, and we can ignore international law because others do so as well. So I'll leave it there, uh, but uh, I think we'll come back on lots of those areas uh, probably in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And our second speaker is Tatiana Zerzhenko, who is a researcher at the Center for East European and International Studies, ZOIS, in Berlin. She studies borders and border regions in post-Soviet space, memory politics, conflict, and post-conflict societies, as well as gender and feminism. Her book, entitled Borderlands into Bordered Lands, Geopolitics of Identity in Post-Soviet Ukraine, was published in 2010, and she has also published articles in Geopolitics, Eurasia Studies, and other journals. She was a professor at Karazin Kharkiv National University in Ukraine, um, and that is the same institution from which she earned her PhD. Uh, Tatiana. Good evening, and thank you very much for inviting me. Can you hear me good? Good. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this important uh, panel. I think it's a very important topic, and I'm glad that this is, uh, it's not forgotten. <clears throat> and um, probably I would like to... Um, <laughs> mention how I actually arrived to this topic. Um, uh, and um, as was already mentioned, I <clears throat> um, have been doing research on borders and borderlands, particularly focusing on Ukraine. I did a lot of research at the Ukrainian-Russian border um, in Kharkiv and Belgorod in better times when the border was um, <clears throat> easy to cross. And actually was um, exactly two years ago planning to go to Kharkiv Oblast to do research um, at the border with Russia. And my destination was Kupiansk and Vavchansk. So I was already kind of preparing my field trip. And I had to cancel it last moment because of the Russian invasion. But as I was already, so to say, <laughs> Um, on my way, <laughs> I started kind of following events unfolding uh, in Kharkiv Oblast, which was um, uh, both both um, places were occupied in the first days of the Russian invasion, and I could not kind of stop following um, through social media and, of course, personal contacts and so on. So how this thing, this new phase of the Russian occupation looks like what is going on. So, and this developed into a kind of a small project. So I, I uh, what I will do probably, I will uh, say a couple of words between um, the Russian occupation of 2014 and to 2022. Uh, I will continue um, saying some words about uh, main <clears throat> instruments Russia has been using to establish uh, control over the occupied territories and, and how um, the, the Ukrainian state and the Ukrainian society uh, <clears throat> met this uh, challenge of, of the Russian occupation. And probably if I still have like time, I will conclude with the deoccupation agenda and what challenges deoccupation <clears throat> is posing for Ukraine. If not, I will leave it for the discussion. So uh, this is probably, it's important to remember that the, the Russian occupation started not two years ago, but already in 2014. And the question is, of course, interesting if, if the Russian um, occupation playbook is, uh, has changed or Russia is uh, actually uh, acting according to the same scenario. Uh, we know that, that uh, in case of Crimea, it was actually, um, uh, uh, Russia used the moment of political crisis in Ukraine Russia could uh, somehow um, draw on, on pro-Russian mobilization from below, which um, took place in Crimea. It was also with the minimal use of, of uh, violence. Um, and uh, actually important for the Russian narrative was that that Russia saved uh, Crimean, Crimeans, uh, Crimean residents from the war coming from Kyiv. So this, this moment that it was Russia was bringing peace, not war, was very important, uh, I think, for for actually for legitimizing this uh, this move. 
And of course, uh, um, in the Russian society, the annexation of Crimea um, met, was met with, with uh, enthusiastic support. Um, if we look at Donbass case, it was actually a very different scenario because uh, uh, the occupation of uh, the parts of the Donbass and um, of the Donetsk and Lugansk republics um, was a kind of continuing process, right? And it was more like a hybrid uh, creeping of occupation. And many in Ukraine would even have difficulties to call it like a occupation in the traditional sense. Because Russia instigated this military conflict in Donbass uh, actually to, to um, uh, have a leverage over Ukraine and and uh, Russia's aim in Donbas was not an annexation, <clears throat> but uh, uh, kind of uh, reintegration of of this region back into Ukraine uh, as a kind of autonomous pro-Russian entity. And and of course, at the same time, Russia uh, politic uh, supported the republics, so-called republics, politically, military, and economically. Uh, so this kind of uh, period, when when this uh, Russian occupation was in a way normalized, lasted until um, February uh, 22, when Russia officially recognized Donetsk and Lugansk republics and, and promised military help. Now, the occupation which started in 22, in comparison to, to these previous uh, um, phases, uh, of course, took place as a result of, of the full-scale military invasion. And this is, of course, uh, the main difference. Uh, also, I think the main difference is, is Russia does not hide uh, its goal of territorial expansion. So Russia is not saying it's uh, Russia is not involved, like it was in Crimea and even in Donbass. Um, like um, this was um, sorry the, um, uh, Russia was claiming that 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 it's uh, um, it's not involved in this uh, in this crisis and Ukraine in in uh, uh, 2022 was in a much better shape the Ukrainian state the state institutions were in better shape and and Ukrainian society, there was no pro-Russian mobilization from below. So this was also a very different situation. Of course, even in the 2022, we can uh, talk about different regimes emerging on the ground and different experiences of the Russian occupation, depending on the duration of the occupation, military situation, the level of destruction and depopulation. So if we think about parts of Kyiv, Sumy, Chernihiv Oblast, which were occupied only for a short period of time, but where actually the Russian army behaved uh, um, uh, very brutally uh, uh, towards the local population. And we, and if we talk about parts of Kherson and Zaporizhia Oblast, which were taken uh, without um, much military resistance without much destruction. And we could also compare it to what happened to Mariupol, Izum, and Rubizhne, where there was a significant destruction of houses and infrastructure and depopulation. We can see that this on the ground, these experiences of the occupation have been very different. Um, now, uh, to what extent, uh, I am sure that, that uh, in Kremlin there were various scenarios and various plans on the table, and probably for some time it was not clear, uh, and even maybe there were some hopes that there will be regime change in Kyiv, and then occupied territories could be used also as a bargaining chip in the negotiations between Ukraine and Russia, but then it became quite uh, soon it became clear that, for example, this new People's Republic scenario, which worked in Donbass, are not going to, to work on the newly occupied territories. The only oblast center which was under Russian control was Kherson, uh, so the newly occupied. And it, it um, somehow the Kherson People's Republic did not materialize for the reasons we can discuss. So in a way, um, 
in a way, uh, the the annexation um, uh, was uh, started to be discussed. The the in in which uh, in which way uh, Russia is going somehow to incorporate these territories. There were talks about kind of uh, uh, um, Crimea putting together with the, the south of Ukraine, creating a new federal district. We we know that there were like several kind of. Uh, the 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 official referendum was postponed because Russia the situation on the front was changing and actually Russia wanted to consolidate uh, its control over the occupied territories but also to create bodies which would would could conduct this referendum on the ground so this all took time and it was uh, basically in September uh when when ukraine started the counteroffensive in kharkiv oblast that the russians were forced somehow to hurry up with this referendum so you um know that that um september 22 was was a kind of uh, uh, the moment when uh uh yeah, so when, when the the annexation, the official annexation changed the situation on the ground and uh, created a new a new reality, at least from the Russian perspective, new legal reality. Even after that, in November 22, uh, Russians were forced to leave Kherson and the right bank of Dnieper. So even after the, the official annexation, which gave hope to U Ukrainians that the this this the occupation efforts by military force can continue. Uh, but then what happened next is basically from beginning of uh, 2023, uh, Russia started a political and economic integration of the newly occupied territories. So the 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 uh, Russian banks opened the um, branches. Uh, uh, Russian uh, tax authorities, um, whatever. So uh, this has become, from the Russian perspective, like part of the Russian territory with all state bodies and also branches of political parties uh, operating on, on these territories. And the next uh, uh, aim was preparing like uh, regional elections in September 23. Uh, then the Kremlin issued several important decrees accelerating passportization on these territories and also preparing legal ground for, for the elections because uh, the, the martial law, <clears throat> the, the Russian legislation was changed to allow like elections uh, under, uh, under current situation. And uh, uh, yeah, and then the after May uh, 23, um, this 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 amend amendments were, were made, and um, so the elections were held in September in four newly annexed regions. And now we know that the presidential elections are going to be the new um, step stone. So what Russia, what instruments Russia were using? Uh, uh, of course, uh, <clears throat> uh, they started to create military civil administrations as a, as a first step to establish control. Uh, but it's also interesting if we look back, okay, <laughs> if we look back that, that for some time, um, um, uh, local um, Ukrainian self-administration was tolerated on the occupied territories, for example, in Kherson, for two or three months, uh, the mayor of Kherson mm, was still in power. So there was uh, some kind of transitional period. Among, uh, let me just um, uh, list these uh, instruments very briefly, and I will stop with, with this. So uh, kidnapping local politicians, municipal leaders, uh, with the aim of forcing people to collaborate, uh, but also isolating uh, what they consider dangerous elements, pro-Ukrainian activists, uh, veterans of the Ukrainian army, and so on. Of course, informational politics, uh, cutting Ukrainians from the, um, uh, from the Ukrainian uh, information sources and um, controlling internet, controlling um, uh, social media, 
um, pressure on Ukrainian internet providers and so on. And then uh, instrumentalization of the humanitarian aid, financial assistance, social benefits, passportization, which was already mentioned, of course, deployment of cultural, symbolic and memory politics, education, uh, switching to Russian curricula, and uh, more recently, uh, reconstruction projects, uh, which are supposed to show that these, these territories have future in Russia, economic patronage projects where Russian regions are obliged to invest and support um, it, um, new Russian territories like St. Petersburg is supporting Mariupol. Um, and demographic uh, rearrangements, yeah, displacement, um, forced evacuation, and so on. So I will stop here at, and uh, will continue during the uh, Q&A se session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tatiana. Our next speaker is Alexander Milnik, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute of Communication, Culture, Information, and Technology at the University of Toronto. His research, research focuses on the history of modern Ukraine and modern Russia, um, with a focus on nationalism, political violence, security, and memory politics. He's working on a book on the history of the Rusto-Ukrainian War, 2014 to the present, uh, and has another book entitled World War II as an Identity Project, as well as a number of articles published in many journals. Alexander? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the kind words and introduction. I'll preface my uh, presentation with saying that what I will talk about today is part of a larger study on the occupation of the Kherson region. Uh, uh, it is based both on the empirical research, but I also lived in the region from the start of the war until approximately mid-June. So I will try to bring into focus some of the details that maybe await sort of the ma ma macro discussions about about this development because i think some of these issues are quite important including in the context that the previous presenters have mentioned so i will start uh, the special military operation which vladimir putin announced on 24th february 2022 had as its, as its central objective the overthrow of the ukrainian government and the imposition of the pro-russian political regime Preceded by months of coercive diplomacy, the military mobilization in the Russian-controlled parts of eastern Ukraine and the recognition of the so-called People's Republics, the campaign began as a strategic military psychological operation. The goal was not the defeat of the Ukrainian armed forces on the battlefield and the occupation of Ukraine as a whole, but, but the effort to affect the political collapse of the Ukrainian government. The apparent belief was that the military would not resist, while the bulk of the population would welcome the Russians as liberators from the supposedly oppressive rule by unpopular Ukrainian elites, Nazis in Putin's speak. Moving with the Russian troops were former members of the Yanukovych clan and other pro-Russian exiles who hoped to become part of the new ruling regime. The armored columns entered Ukraine from multiple directions against the backdrop of missile attacks on the military infrastructure and the intense informational warfare which emphasized the Russian military preponderance and imminent collapse of the so-called Nazi regime. Initially, the Russian grouping consisted of some 60 battalion tactical groups, the armed formations of the so-called People's Republics, various mercenary forces and special police units, whose primary task would consist in suppressing civilian resistance and maintaining public order. About 40 additional battalion tactical groups entered the theater in the following weeks. In line with the political objectives of the campaign, the main effort was directed towards Ukraine's capital. The Ukrainian leadership did not anticipate the full-scale invasions, the warnings from the Western governments notwithstanding. They expected that the main attack would take place along the existing front line at the Donbas. Therefore, most of Ukrainian combat ready units, 10 brigades in total, were concentrated in the east. Meanwhile, the lengthy stretch of the Ukrainian-Belarusian and Ukrainian-Russian border from Zhitomir in the north to Kharkiv in the east was protected merely by five brigades of Ukraine's armed forces and the motley crew of the border protection units, the National Guard, police and territorial militias which came into existence following the start of the general mobilization on 24th February. The Russian numerical advantage was even more pronounced in the south, where the Ukrainian military command could field only one incomplete brigade, which resulted in the rapid collapse of the Ukrainian defenses and the occupation of the significant areas in the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov regions. 
The military occupation that ensued after 24th February does stemmed from Putin's strategic miscalculation the peculiarities of the evolving military situations in different sectors. Around Kyiv and in the northeast, Russian military rule was short and always closely intertwined with war fighting. And this is very important distinction with what would transpire in the south, as Tatiana already mentioned. It was characterized by the lack of institutional capacity and intensive security operations that exacted significant toll on the civilian population. The subject that I will not discuss in this in great detail at this time, but I have a separate article in uh, being prepared at this time on, on the situation around Ukraine's capital. Uh, by contrast, in the south, the occupation engulfed considerable territory, lasted a long time, and the Russians made a concerted effort to build institutional structures of the occupation regime. The experiences of the population in, in the south varied based on whether they were in the combat zone, in the areas effectively controlled by Russians and their proxy forces, or in the unoccupied towns and villages within the occupied territory. This is also important to keep in mind talking about the situation, especially in spring 2022, is that the Russians did not control the terrain everywhere. It was in the combat areas that the Russian troops committed the largest number of war crimes and human rights violations, albeit on a comparatively smaller scale in the north and in the northeast in February and March 2022. In characterizing Russian policies in the south in spring and summer 2022, 22, I used the term loose occupation. Uh, for several months, the Russians and their proxy forces were present only in larger cities, at the nuclear power plant in, an er in an Ergodar and along major communication lines. Many communities, especially in the left bank, were effectively unoccupied. Small contingents would come only sporadically to, to imitate the projection of power rather than to actually control the life of the population. No less importantly, in spring 2022, Russian control over the occupied communities was far from absolute, even where permanent garrisons were stationed. To be sure, the invaders immediately took off air Ukrainian television networks and radio stations and detained multiple people whom they suspected of being members of resistance movement or potential opposition to their rule. Even so, in the absence of clear instructions from Moscow, they didn't take down Ukrainian flags and often didn't even interfere with the activities of local self-government bodies. Neither should one overlook Russian manpower shortages, absence of garrisons in many communities, and until late May 2022, the continuing work of Ukrainian internet providers, cell phone companies, and electronic payment systems. In addition, the Ukrainian authorities influenced the occupied not only by publicizing Russia's losses and war crimes, but also by soliciting information about Russian forces, issuing calls for civil disobedience, targeting collaborators, and encouraging migration to the Ukraine-controlled ter territory. It is within this context that one must situate pro-Ukrainian rallies, which in March 2022 took place in many communities, especially in the city of Kherson. Anxious to increase control, the Russian leadership bolstered the security forces with units of the Russian Guard and separatist formations from the Donbass. The latter appeared at road checkpoints throughout the Kherson and Zaporizhia regions at the latest by mid-March. Meanwhile, the Federal Security Service and its collaborators from the so-called People's Republic started to survey social networks for evidence of pro-Ukrainian attitudes. As the security situation deteriorated, the number of refugees from the occupied territories increased. A trickle in March became a stream in April and May, turning into a proverbial flood during the summer, when repressive measures extended to a broad range of Ukraine loyalists and Russian military established permanent garrison in many smaller left-bank communities. The locals everywhere realized that the deoccupation was not coming soon. Uh, and this is also, I think, important to emphasize in this context, because I, I think often there is an assumption that they're targeting a very specific population categories, like military veterans, like activists or government officials, which is true. But it, but there is also, I think, the, there is a shift of strategy in what they are trying to do, and they shift from the logic of the regime change to the goal of incorporating the occupied territories, they also shift the logic of repression, which becomes much more pervasive. And they start, I think, strategically targeting people who simply identify with the Ukrainian state as such. So that's where we, we see, for example, they arrest people who participated in the rallies or posted pro-Ukrainian messages on social networks, etc. Meanwhile, the so, so the shift from the imperatives of regime change to the 
incorporation strategy also transformed the fundamental parameters of the Russian imperial project. As late as 2021, the Russian president, like his Soviet counterparts, acknowledged the legitimacy of Ukrainian ethnicity and statehood, even if he posited the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians and castigated the pro-Western Ukraine as anti-Russia, quote-unquote. By April 2022, however, the postulation of sovereignty over, quote-unquote, Russia's historical lands, a long-term objective of Russian imperial nationalists, required the complete elimination of Ukrainian identity, at least in the territories controlled by the Russian forces at the time. The incorporation strategy, which took shape gradually from April 2022 onwards, featured several interconnected objectives, informational dominance, institutionalization of the administrative apparatus, suppression, neutralization, and expulsion of Ukrainian loyalists, transformation of political attitudes and cultural identities. In 214, and this is, I think, will I will uh, respond indirectly to David's earlier comment. Uh, in 2014, the Russian authorities easily secured allegiances of mayors, law enforcement officials, and public servants in Crimea and the Donbas. But in the territories occupied after 24th February 2022, most elected officials in southern Ukraine refused to cooperate. Faced with blackmail and torture, most chose to leave their post and exited the occupied territories, along with many of their subordinates. Months into the war, the invaders managed to recruit about 50 politicians, mostly deputies of regional and municipal councils. Uh, to put these figures in perspective, the local elections of 2020 produced more than 1,100 1, regional and municipal deputies in the Kherson and Zaporizhia regions alone. The Russians fared no better when it came to recruiting policemen, primarily because the Ukrainian authorities had thoroughly screened the ranks of loyalty during the police reform a few years earlier. In the face of such difficulties, the occupiers had to lean heavily on collaborating officials from the DNR and LNR, as well as political appointees from Crimea and the Russian Federation proper. Uh, for example, in my district, which is Vrchny Ragachik in, in the left bank part of the Kherson region, uh, According to Russian propaganda newsreels from late 2023, all policemen came from Russia. So there was not a single local person they could, could co-opt into the Ukrainian police forces. The situation, however, was not static and the number of local collaborators increased after the Russian authorities started to institutionalize the occupation apparatus and establish dominance in the informational sphere. The recruitment of collaborators featured not only threats and blackmail, but also material incentives and real opportunities of upward social mobility. So, so, so in, in a way, I argue that it's not necessarily co-optation of local elites, but it's the creation of the new, new elite from people that remain there. And within this context, it is also important to keep in mind the extent of our migration, because I think sometimes it gets lost in there. And I even hear from Ukrainians who live abroad, well, millions of Ukrainians stayed in the occupied territory, but this is just not the case. And some we're talking about, like, in some cases, 60-70% of the population living. Like in my district in 2019, uh, according to the official figures, there was more than 11,000 people residing According to the data that Russians released, like now only about four and a half thousand people remain, and that's many of them are older people who simply are tied to the land and they just can't face some any life there. So this is important to keep in perspective here. Efforts to eliminate the Ukrainian identity manifested itself various ways: surveillance, physical persecution of Ukraine loyalists, so arrests, detentions, torture, if only temporary destruction of the Ukrainian symbolic orders and this here I would mention that it's the Russians are even more reactionary compared to Soviet policies so in one of the cities in the Zaporizhia region there was a Taras Shevchenko I don't remember whether in Melitopol or Berdyansk there was Taras Shevchenko monument in the downtown so they didn't destroy it, but they removed it from the city center. So there's kind of explicit downgrading of the status of the ethnic Ukrainians in the contemporary Russian state, as, as compared not even to Ukraine of 1990, after 1991, but to the Soviet Union, because that was part of the legacy of the Soviet uh, sort of Ukrainianization project. Uh, 
So there's also coercive passportization, uh, as other speakers mentioned, cultural influence campaign and Russification of the education system, as well as effort to change the demographic composition of individual communities. I think I will stop here and then if we have questions, maybe we'll pursue them in more detail. Thank you very much, Alexander. And our final speaker today is Francisca Exler, who is a lecturer in history at Free University Berlin and a research associate at the Center of History and Economics at University of Cambridge. Her research interests include 20th century East European, Russian and German history, war and society, legal history, and war crimes, trials, myth, memory, and trauma. Her book is entitled, recently published in April 2022, Ghosts of War, Nazi Occupation and Its Aftermath in Soviet Belarus. And that came out with Cornell University Press um, and is an award-winning book. Uh, Francisca? Thank you very much. From, can you hear me well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful. Yes, been... we can hear you. And I just want to remind the audience as well that you can use the Q&A to ask questions now for the speakers who've spoken as well as for Francisca as well as she's going forward now. Thanks. Thank you. Um, it's, I just wanted to say it's been really interesting so far um, to listen to my, my colleagues, and I very much look forward to this really important discussion. Um, so what I would like to contribute to the discussion is based on research that I've conducted in the history of the German occupation and its aftermath in the Soviet Union, but also more generally um, and comparatively on how post-war societies grappled with people's wartime choices under occupation and the question of these legacies and whether post-war reconciliation within one society, but perhaps also between the occupier and the occupied is possible, and if so, on what grounds. Um, so Alexander has already, um, you know, briefly hinted at the complexity of the term collaboration um, and or in cooperation as well. And the many issues and problems that are associated with is what I'd like to sort of contribute as a first thought. Um, so attempts at defining collaboration are often met with a concern that the notion fails to adequately capture the complexities of wartime reality. That is to say, the different ways in which individuals under occupation come to be associated with the occupying power and the many gray zones in that encounter. At the same time, I think it's, it's important for scholars that we don't shy away from defining this term only because it is so present in wartime and post-war public discourse. And it's a moral category for many, um, as well as a legal category. In my own research, I'm following the historian Jan Gross, um, who in his writings about the German occupation of much of um, Europe during the Second World War, has argued that collaboration is an, quote, and I quote, occupier-driven phenomenon. So what he means is that people's choices under occupation were first and foremost determined by how much engagement the occupiers wanted and what kind. So did they want local mayors or not? Did they want local police forces or not? And what about teachers, office clerks, anyone else who works in the local administrations? What is their role supposed to be? Now, if we stay with the example of the Second World War and Nazi occupation, um, then not all occupation regimes were or are as murderous and brutal as the German one during the Second World War. But even here, we saw significant variety across Europe. So during the Second World War, German occupation was overall milder in Western than in Eastern Europe. But even in Eastern Europe, um, we saw that while all civilians found the space within which they could act circumscribed by the Germans, that space was much smaller, almost non-existent for Jews, but it was much larger for non-Jews. So what this means, if we you know, kind of generalize now, is that if we want to understand people's choices under occupation, I think it's important to understand what kind of local occupation the occupying power wanted and also whether it treated different population groups or individuals differently. And then of course, also how much violence or coercion was involved or is involved when trying to get locals to work for, for them in whatever way. In a second step, we have to understand what choices people in occupied territory thought or, or think that they had or have. In other words, we have to shift our analysis to local perceptions of how much space they have to act. So in the case of Nazi-occupied Europe, um, Jan Gross has therefore argued that people's engagement with the Germans, its logic, appeal, self-justification and social base emerge in each country at the intersection between the occupier's intent 
and the occupied's perception about the range of options that um, people had at their disposal. Finally, we often also have to factor in change over time. As the political scientist Statis Kalibas has argued, war is a, and I quote, transformative phenomenon. The advent of war and the experience of violence transforms individual preferences, choices, behavior, and identities, which are then continuously shaped and reshaped in the course of the conflict. What this then means for us as scholars is that in each particular case, the meaning and character of people's involvement with the occupiers have to be carefully circumscribed in um, space and time. Otherwise, the terms on which it occurred cannot be properly understood. So because of the, the many problems that are associated with the term collaboration, including how morally charged that term is, especially in wartime societies, historians also use other terms to capture the complexity of human behavior under occupation. These terms include cooperation, complicity, entanglement, as well as choiceless choices or impossible choices. Complicity is here defined as the state of being involved with others in wrongdoing or illegal activity, and as such, of course, it invokes notions of criminal guilt. Entanglement is perhaps of all of these contests the most difficult to grasp um, analytically. It covers acts that would not face legal charges, but rather that form part of the everyday moral gray zones of the occupation. I think in general, we can say that complicity and entanglement are questions of degree. Or if we put it differently, we can say that under occupation, we usually find a wide spectrum of complicity and a wide spectrum of um, entanglement, which then shifts over time. So moving away from these sort of scholarly attempts at conceptualizing collaboration um, and finding other words to describe sort of the, the wide spectrum of human behavior that you see in, in occupied societies, there are three perhaps former brief thoughts that I would like to bring to the discussion. So the first one is on post-war political and even legal um, reckoning. Again, if we go back to the aftermath of the Second World War in Europe, we can see that all societies grappled with questions of collaboration and complicity, and all states, whether authoritarian or democratic or something in between, used the criminal justice system to do so. These trials were particularly flawed in dictatorships like the Soviet Union, where we have this tension on the one hand between Soviet authorities um, who seek to punish locals they accuse of having committed wartime atrocities in the name of German power, but on the other hand, also use collaboration or treason as it was called back then to establish political loyalty. But these trials in the, the um, aftermath of the Second World War are also flawed in more or less democratic society for a variety of different reasons, having amongst others to do this is with this, this is a very emotional moment, one of revenge amongst incredible death and destruction. But, and that's sort of the, the another thought I'd like to bring in here is that, especially when it comes to these, these questions of low level engagement with an occupying power, so one that is often associated with office clerks in the local city administration or teachers or really anyone fulfilling municipal duties, it is often impossible to reconstruct fully what happened um, to establish, if you will, the, the, the facts um, or the, the entire picture. Um, I think Joshua Jaffa's article on the um, city Izum and Kharkiv region, which was published in the New York about a year ago, shows that quite well how even in the present day, in a sort of um, post-occupation setting, where journalists set out to investigate these complicated questions, it is often really impossible to establish um, in full what an individual might have done and for whatever reasons with sort of conflicting, um, contradicting statements being made. Um, then there are also the cases though where, where that he identifies where we see neighbors who likely used the occupation to take revenge on their neighbors for, for pre-war social conflicts that had little to do with political um, orientation, but really were about social interhuman kind of conflicts. Um, so another thought I'd like to bring into this discussion is about post-war societies. Um, so it seems to me based on the research that I've done in the post-war Soviet Union is that this question of what did you do, you know, the suspicion, the distrust, all of this not only destroys communities or, or former friendships, um, colleagues, you know, neighborly relations, but it really has the potential of poisoning 
if you will, um, um, societies for, for many decades after the war. So I'm not, not suggesting that this will or is happening in, in Ukraine, but I'm just saying that what I've seen in the case of the post-war Soviet Union is how these um, these these questions of who lived under occupation can easily come up decades after the war in, in unrelated social conflicts where to sort of cast doubt on someone, and by the way, they lived under occupation. And then to conclude, sort of the last thought um, I would like to bring in is concerns question of social reconstruction, reconciliation. Research on another context, so research on um, and particular anthropological research on post-war states like Rwanda and former Yugoslavia has shown the many challenges that are inherent to this process. So this is, of course, somewhat of a different context. Um, uh, these are um, what can be characterized more as civil war I mean, um, societies or where we have a lot more um, sort of communal violence. But I think some of these findings of that research are applicable to states who emerge from occupation too. And so what their research shows is that social reconstruction really requires working at the level of local communities. It requires reliable, transparent state structures, a will to listen to each other, and also probably no fear of consequences. So the, the problem here, of course, is the fear of, of legal repercussions. Um, is it really possible to talk openly about what somebody might have done in occupied territories without this fear that he or she or they might be prosecuted for that? Um, I think that is something that is easier to do for later generations. Um, so when, when these processes are less affected by con consideration if a um, person could still be prosecuted for the wartime actions, to me, it seems that in the immediate post war period, it's especially difficult when everything is so raw and the pain is, is still running um, very deep. And it also seems to me that there are limits to what can be achieved. That, again, this is only based on my research on the post war Soviet Union in an authoritarian setting, so a very different context, but a lot there remained unresolved. So a lot of um, conflicts relating to the war could never really be addressed. Um, even sort of in this very kind of intimate, um, friendly, what used to be sort of friendly settings of, of neighbors or friends. Um, and reconciliation, if at all, often did not happen and many ties remained severed. So there are lots of silences remain. I'll end with that. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much for for those comments. Um, it's it's very <laughs> it's very heavy stuff and a lot to a lot to think of. So very very much appreciative. Um, let me again invite the audience. Uh, the Q and A is open now, and same thing in the comments on YouTube. If you have questions, I'm going to kick off with a question of my own, which I'm going to address at uh, to all of the panelists. Which is I I'd like to so I. I've already learned a ton from everything that you guys have said here today, but I, I would love to get more of an insight into the role of time here. Um, it, is, see, it seems self-evident to me that the, that the effects of an occupation compound over time um, and that they become stronger as more time passes. But I'm looking um, for some sort of guidance on how what is the best sort of model to have in my head about the effect of time. Is it something that we think of as linear? that just it's incrementally, whatever the effects of occupation are, they're incrementally more and more the more time goes on. Is it something where we should think of this more as like a tipping model where it's like you hit a certain point and beyond that point, a lot of things all of a sudden start to happen, right? A moment of despair, a moment of when it looks like it's not gonna go back. Um, is there, is it is is it also worth thinking of this in terms of like, there's some point in time at which past it becomes just sort of much, much harder to reverse the effects of occupation? And if so, what would be the characteristics of that moment in time? Or is it is it sort of different in the sense that it's like, you know, at some point where like you've hit X, X point in time in the occupation, however much you go on beyond that doesn't really make much of a difference. And there's always the possibility that the impacts of the occupation can be reversed and, you know, there's a lot that happens in the first two years, but then beyond that, it's always the sort of same sort of thing. And and maybe I'm I'm asking for the impossible to give a kind of generalizable sense about that. But just even getting at this sense of whether it's it's a kind of linear accumulation or it, it has these sort of key tipping points or turning points would be really useful. So I'm 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 interested in every in anyone's uh, in any and all of your comments on this point. Anyone want to go first? Alexander? Yeah. And then David. Okay, David. Thank you, Joshua. That's a very good question. I think uh, 
time matters, uh, but it's also not just time. It's it's ultimately connected with power on the ground and the, the perception of the strategic situation. I think because the national mobilization was so intense at the start of the war and because for several months the occupied territories remained within Ukraine's information space because of the internet, primarily social networks, telegram channels, and uh, because there was a perception that there is a possibility that the Russians would be expelled and because the Russians manpower was very thin on the ground in many communities, the Russians had difficulty persuading the population of their ability to stay. So that relates ultimately to their ability to recruit collaborators, among other things, in various localities. Moreover, I would add that what I observed personally at the local level, there was considerable amount of social pressure on potential collaborators, people who were known to have pro-Russian attitudes for several months in the course of the spring. And I did that too. We, 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 we would not threaten them openly, but we would make our positions clear. And in the situation where they feel they are outnumbered, they simply didn't take any even effort to make their views very clear in this situation, much less to take any initiative. Some of them received threats outright on the internet from anonymous sources but sometimes also from people they knew so it, 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 it's this kind of dynamics but then what happens over time as the russians consolidate their rule there's a series of symbolic steps that, that are taking place they start for example dispersing protests in kherson and other cities in the course of march and april then they take down ukrainian flags and uh, then the Ukrainian offensive, which was supposed to materialize, many people expected it to materialize in the course of spring already after the Russians retreated from around Kyiv and in the northeast, then it didn't happen. And then the Russians started turning off internet and then they put garrisons and there is usually a correlation with the presence of Russian troops on the ground and sort of perceptions of insecurity. So as long as the Russian troops are in the city, people start leaving. So that, that's the kind of dynamics at work. And, and, and once you pro-Ukrainian loyalists start leaving, the, the local balance of power shifts even more so than those pro-Ukrainian people who remain in the locality, they become demoralized and they have to pick it up. But because there's a perception of a growing Russian power, but also they become less secure because parts of their network are leaving. Like the moment, for example, I learned that my brother was planning to leave. I knew I had to leave too because I wouldn't be able to rely on anybody there. I knew that. So that kind of dynamics that's happening. there. And then once it becomes a mass phenomenon, it's kind of a snowball effect, then Ukraine loses influence on the occupied population generally when this human infrastructure is removed. David? And then Tatiana? Yeah, thanks. It is a really good question. And, a, you know, Russia realizes this. That's why its slogan from the very beginning, beginning has been, you know, Russia is here forever um, on billboards everywhere, um, which, of course, turned out to be hollow in the case of Kherson uh, and Kharkiv. Uh, but I think you can also see these tipping points where there's a certain uh, period in which people can wait and hope. Um, but I think the failure of the counteroffensive last year um, probably shifted many people either to leave uh, definitively um, or to essentially start to acquiesce. And I've you know, heard that anecdotally um, from a number of people that you have to choose eventually whether you uh, begin to find a long term mechanism for survival or you essentially leave uh, if you can leave. And I think uh, my sense is that some of that tipping point emerged sort of late last year um, for at least some people. Um, I think, you know, we can obviously see these different timing periods because we've had Crimea and we've had uh, the de facto occupation in DNR and LNR. And I think an important process here, and obviously Russia is putting a lot of emphasis on this, is the socialization process through education. Um, and again, you know, there is some quite good studies of education in uh, Donetsk under Russian rule and the extent to which that has had an impact in socializing young people um, and with a big emphasis on youth in the occupied territories that Russia is uh, pushing at the moment. All these, uh, the Malada, Malada Guardia group, this movement of the first, these uh, 
these youth movements are being pushed very strongly, lots of uh, sponsored study tours to Russia and so on. This is clearly the long-term strategy of Russia to try and win over uh, large parts of the youth and use that kind of socialization process. So again, that takes time, but it's um, uh, really important. And then just finally alongside that, um, there's uh, you know something about the propaganda process where you become cut off from uh, perhaps some forms of information flow. And although obviously everyone still has access to often to Telegram, there's lots of different opinions in there and so forth. Um, I think there is a process where uh, certainly there's some interesting research by Internews on the way in which there's certain fatigue in trying to look for um, alternative forms of information and you start to readjust to some of the Russian language uh, material around there. And I think it's fair to say for people who work in that, who live in that Russian language um, uh, information space, um, the fact that so much Ukrainian media has shifted into Ukrainian language might facilitate that process as well. So there are interesting stages that come after sort of two years in that I think um, do start to make it harder, obviously, uh, to, to start to um, really maintain a very strong sense of resistance among some parts of the population, just because, as Alexander was saying, you know, large numbers of people have left, uh, and those that remain are often elderly or young, or in other ways, um, somewhat marginal in society. So uh, it makes it much harder to keep that sense of resistance going over time. Thank you. Tatiana? Yeah, very briefly, not to repeat what was already said, I think it's a very important and very interesting question, uh, the temporalities of occupation and temporalities of war. Certainly, the, the um, <clears throat> occupation is experienced uh, on a personal level, sub Objectively, yeah, uh, like uh, what I heard from um, uh, many people from Ukraine uh, being on occupied territories or not, it's like the war is is changing this feeling of time, yeah. So your life is put on pause and the, your life is suspended. So you your plans are cancelled and you are not in control of your of your life. And I think this. Uh, on the one hand, this kind of personal personal temporality is, is something we will probably, uh, I don't know, with what means uh, we need more like anthropologically informed research on this. On the other hand, of course, we have like complete, uh, conflicting and alternative uh, temporalities uh, created by Russia on the occupied territories and, and Ukraine, so different kind of... Uh, alternative futures for these regions offered um, uh, yeah, by, by, by Ukraine and Russia. And we have this Russian attempt to build kind of the, the history of this region into, into Russian imperial history, kind of uh, <clears throat> denying this, uh, this Ukrainian 30 years of Ukrainian independence as a kind of historical mistake, right? And so, we have also like political attempts to con construct and reconstruct these temporalities. Yeah, so I think this is indeed something to discuss. Thank you. Um, now I'll turn to an audience question from Janet Johnson, who is researching um, the occupation and the use of sexual sexualized violence by Russia. She is asking whether you see a pattern between the various kinds of occupation and different types and quantity of sexualized violence. Are the various occupations gendered in different ways? Or are there different types of levels and application of coercion? Um, I think the question was addressed to me. So uh, I don't have like a a direct answer to this question and i think we know still i know that there are some people doing research on on this important topic like marta havrishka um i i think it's also uh, what i mentioned in the beginning of my like introductory talks these different experiences and different regimes of occupation what what we learned like the most facts what we learned about sexualized violence I think it was during the deoccupation or after the deoccupation of 
uh, the territories around Kiev and and in northern Ukraine and so the in general the the scale of military crimes committed by the Russian army um, and in my eyes it certainly had to do with this fact that that this population was just uh, um, treated local population was treated just uh, as a kind of uh, obstacle and potentially dangerous. Um, Factor, yeah. So the, these people were, I don't know, put in cellars, isolated, even killed if they looked suspicious, and and the in this kind of state of anomie where there was no law, no Ukrainian law anymore, but uh, the Russian law has not arrived yet. So the the certainly, I think most uh, most crimes and most human rights violations happened in in this kind of situation, and then of course when. Um, Maybe I don't know. So it it really requires, um, I think, uh, thorough research. But I also can imagine that as soon as uh, uh, the occupying authorities try to establish some kind of of uh, order and, and bring law and and uh, create kind of uh, um, uh, um, yeah uh, certain certain order. Uh, then maybe um, we 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 see different uh, forms of of uh, uh, use of violence of also sex, sexualized violence when the the occupying authorities probably try to use it as a method of of um, uh, targeted terror and and uh, like dealing with uh, with some dangerous elements and kind of. Um, yeah, so I think it requires more more research, which unfortunately I uh, have not done in this direction. <clears throat> if I could build on that, maybe I, I'd say I think there is a considerable regional variation, and it is important to keep in mind uh, what is happening in many localities where there is no significant fighting. I think there is a correlation between uh, where fighting is taking place <laughs> And where there is this type of violence, I think in in the areas in the south where the Russians moved r r little unimpeded, where they didn't were quoted in many communities for a long time, some disorder broke out. But like in my town, when they moved on twenty six February, they looted every imaginable store. I think in part because their supply was very poor. They they robbed the bank, they robbed the post office, they lo looted drug stores, they looted uh, food stores. But there was no sexual violence. That's one thing. And uh, I talked to many people at the time because I was in the occupied territory and I was sort of trying to monitor developments in various localities and nobody was talking about sexual violence. They say no. Some incidents, of course, always. But there, are, there is sexual violence in any state in, in peacetime. So one shouldn't exaggerate that. But in the combat areas, I think it is different because there are Russian soldiers on the ground. They're not monitored. They have, in some communities, there were more Russian soldiers than the local people. So that kind of creates power imbalances and then generates impunity by itself. So I think it's very important to be sensitive to such distinctions. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask, if, I, I want to go for the Q&A for a question from um, Laura McCready, who wrote that she read an interesting opinion piece that suggested Putin selected 2022 as opposed to some point in the future to invade Ukraine specifically because he thought that the Ukrainian population would be easier to occupy now because they are at most one generation removed from Ukraine being part of the Soviet Union. The argument was that if Russia waited 20 years to invade, they would face much stiffer resistance as the Soviet Union faded in common memory. So the question is, again, this is another question about time, but do you, do you think at this point enough time has passed since the Soviet, since the Soviet Union that this, this, this argument does not make sense, that 20 years from now, 40 years from now, there would have been similar levels of resistance to Russian occupation? Or do you think that we are still sort of, you know, 30 years in, there really was a difference between what it would be like 50 years in as opposed to, say, 10 years out? How does time play a role in that regard? I don't know if anyone would like to take that one. Yeah, David? Well, just briefly, I mean, I'd be interested in uh, others' views on this because I think it's uh, probably varied from place to place. But, you know, my sense is also there is an important 
generational divide often. Um, you know, I'm often talking to younger Ukrainians who broadly share sort of liberal pro-Western um, views, should we say, but they often talk about their grandparents, um, perhaps in, in Donbass or elsewhere, who, who have much um, uh, rather different views often, uh, sometimes pro-Russian, but sometimes really more um, a kind of Soviet identity. And this is quite interesting polling uh, back pre-war in, in uh, Luhansk Oblast, um, which showed that quite a large minority of the population, primarily elderly, shared not a Russian identity, but a, a kind of Soviet identity. In other words, said, my, my homeland is the Soviet Union, right? And that's something you still hear occasionally um, in, in Ukraine today from that older generation, um, which is more, I suppose, a kind of nostalgia for um, an era of um, what they might see as uh, a lack of confrontation, but uh, is a really a sort of misreading in, in, in many ways history. But So I do think that's there, but I, I think there's that generational divide seems... Uh, seems very important because you obviously had this new generation coming through, um, you know, for example, someone like Mariupol, by most people who uh, were there before the war talked about how it was changing over time. You had this younger generation that were doing a lot of interesting you know, cultural events um, and so on and so forth. While you still had quite a conservative, for example, cultural uh, elite that ran museums and cultural institutions. And that clash was, I think, quite important. Um, and over time, my, the assumption would be that that would have continued, uh, and that um, you know embedding of Ukrainian national identity would have would have gone deeper over time. So in that sense, yes, you might say um, I'm not sure that Russia uh, Putin really understands Ukrainian national identity, of course, but uh, you might say he looked at it and thought, well, this is perhaps the last chance I'll get to, to find uh, even anybody who will uh, will be willing to uh, to cooperate to some extent. So yeah, and I think now if you look at um, you know look at what's going on in these regions uh, and the people, for example, I've just been looking at electoral commissions in, in, uh, in occupied territories. It's primarily an older generation, um, and there's a very interesting gendered aspect as well. There's a lot of uh, older women involved in in those processes, um, and very few photographs you'll see have uh, many young people in them. So that is an important aspect that I think um, I'm sure in Moscow. Uh, was part of the consideration, yeah. Uh, Francisca? Um, I think that's a that's a really interesting question and one also that um, sort of my comment is something that, that I'd like to maybe expand into a, a question back because um, there's when we look at research on on what violence does and war does to societies, like one argument that scholars have put forth is that um, I mean, there's obviously, as, as um, uh, Dave was just saying, the, the pre-context to that and, and people's preferences and um, political sort of loyalties and um, worlds that they associate them, some, themselves with prior to that. But then there's also scholarly research that has sort of shown that war and violence, again, like reshapes all of that and um, and can also create these new identities and, and new ties even of solidarity. So not all violence is destructive. I thought it was really interesting, Alexander, what you were mentioning about your own experience um, in Kherson. And, and it seemed to me, and I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that, that um, whether you, you've kind of felt that this was a situation in, in which then new ties of solidarity were forged between people who had known each other before, but now found out that they're in support of the Ukrainian state, for example, and that whether there are new networks created as a result of that. But, but um, sort of my question then would be, I think, um, I think for for scholars, then the task is really like it's really the intricate task of being able to to dis, um, to identify what of that is already there pre-violence and pre-war and what then changes in the course of that. And maybe going back to your, your earlier question about time, again, based on, on the Second World War um, and the occupation we've seen there, it seems to me that that time works on the, on an individual level, time works different for everybody and violence really plays a crucial role in here and the extent of, of personal suffering. So the legacies of occupation also very much, I think, tied to how one personally and one's family experiences the occupation. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to try to combine a question I have with a question from Catherine Bothman. Uh, I wanted to ask all of our uh, panelists about sources and how they do research. I understand it's been very useful in, in a 
sad way for um, Alexander Milnik to have been present at the very beginning. But could you talk a little bit about um, how you try to understand what's going on in the occupied regions, what kind of regions, what kind of sources you rely on, and perhaps the ethics of conducting interviews or the ethics of talking to people who are in such a precarious or dangerous situations in, uh, on the occupied territory. Um, and um, Francisca, as a historian, kind of what, what sources did you rely on and what kinds of um, information you know, would you be looking for uh, if you were uh, going to say, you know, think about historians reconstructing what's happening there um, in the future? Um, and then I'm going to try to combine this question about media. I mean, does is there a local media? Can you rely on uh, local media as a source? And and uh, somewhat related, although not really related, question uh, about um, what role does Ukrainian media have to play in the deoccupation or the reintegration process? Any, if if any, thank you. Thank you for your question. It's a very important one, I think. Uh, I use a broad range of sources. Uh, I do not interview people out of principle, I, and I didn't purposefully get the information while I was there. When I was there, I, usually, I simply took the position of observing the events, and uh, I wouldn't solicit information about specific connections, but... Uh, because I knew there were some acti resistance activities whereof I was observing some of them. I didn't collect this information, didn't inquire about broader networks and stuff like that because like, it was very volatile. Indeed, before I left the occupied territories, I had to destroy some of my own research data and transfer them to the cloud beforehand because I had to pass through Russian uh, filtration process in Crimea. So, so that was one of the challenges. But I... I have talked to people afterwards when they left the occupied territories. Some of them maintain contacts with people in the occupied territories. Now it's very challenging. Some information filters, but it, it, it is very different. I would say after most pro-Ukrainian people left the occupied territory, the, the information is very fragmentary. Some of it filters to the uh, telegram channels that Ukrainian loyalists maintain. So... It, some documents get published uh, of the occupation authorities. But, but I have used as sources primarily because there is so many testimonial, so much testimonial evidence on, on YouTube. Like there are various journalistic projects that people they interview people that have lived in the occupied territories in various localities. And uh, oftentimes I have gone over through hours and hours of footage like that was recorded because many journalists were in the occupied territories at least for a couple of months before the Russians actually started persecuting journalists in March, April. So there's a lot of information from that period and they collected testimonies. So I use these testimonies and I gauge their credibility by comparing them with what I know was happening generally. And then obviously there are Russian sources that also need to be read critically, but they are important for understanding the macro context of, of what is happening there. Perhaps to, to follow up on that, in terms of historical sources, I think there are quite some similarities in there in that um, sort of the sources I've used to research this question related to the second one's aftermath are also multi-perspective sort of, um, uh, in this case, um, Soviet um, reports, both wartime partisan reports and post-war Soviet um, uh, documents, German wartime documents, memoirs, um, interviews, um, letters at the time or later on sent to the authorities. So really to get to get as diverse a, a, um, as possible a perspective on this and then to juxtapose them, obviously with the difference that, um, you know, such a thing like like social media didn't didn't yet exist. And so so in some ways, maybe the source basis is even perhaps it's even more fragmented um, than than today. And the problem also that some people leave more written sources, especially states than the non state actors and urban populations more than rural populations. And I think there are limits to how we can balance that out effectively. Just so, on, um, is that, yeah. Um, I mean, I think this, Alexander makes an interesting point about Russian sources, and they are, uh, because we are seeing essentially a Russian administrative occupation, right, uh, an economic occupation, there is quite a paper trail that emerges from that, 
uh, Russian corporate records, for example, thousands of Ukrainian companies have been uh, seized, stolen effectively, uh, and you can now trace their process in the Russian corporate register, which remains open for researchers. Um, uh, and you can see the new owners and uh, different uh, details about them. So much of this is documented. And in many cases, you know, even cases that uh, may turn out uh, at some point to be violations of international law or war crimes um, are being are, are clearly there in Russian media, right? For example, the export of grain illegally from the occupied territories is being celebrated quite often in local media um, in uh, Mariupol and elsewhere. So there is quite a lot of documentary evidence, even from official Russian uh, Russian sources. I would say there are numerous problems. Yes, I mean I was out in Ukraine last week. Uh, trying to talk to people who are monitoring the situation. Um, but uh, as Alexander was saying, there's, there's obviously security concerns with uh, communicating with people on the ground. Obviously, there's a wealth of um, information from those who've left. And there are various projects, I think, uh, doing oral history and recording some of those experiences, which I think are very important. But it's very hard, obviously, to get to the very complex uh, situation on the ground uh, and that every day and very fluid uh, process in which people are essentially trying to survive in very difficult circumstances. Trying to understand that is very difficult. So those voices, um, I think, are often absent for obvious reasons. Um, and then other groups, you know, for example, you know, refugees who've gone to the Russian Federation are very hard to access and very hard to hear from. It's another set of voices that are um, we don't really know much about um, uh, their experiences. Uh, unless they've uh, ended up in Europe uh, or in uh, back in Ukraine. So there's lots of areas of uh, of lack in our knowledge, unfortunately. Um, maybe with time they will come forward, but we just have to fill in the gaps where we can. I mean, there is this astonishing array of Telegram channels, of course, uh, some more reliable than others, uh, but they do provide a fascinating insight into the sort of everyday life sometimes, including this public chats in some, some areas where... People are simply talking about everyday problems. And just on the media, I mean, Russia has sort of filled the information space with these media initiatives, both the sort of state media and also uh, the kind of uh, rather, uh, sort of, I suppose, private initiatives that have put forward new television channels, uh, radio, and of course, this curated set of telegram channels that are all, uh, in one, one way or another, um, put together um, uh, aligned with the Russian position. And I think, interestingly, uh, uh, really a lot of material on YouTube reflecting broadly the Russian position, but occasionally with these sort of, you know, complaints about uh, sort of everyday problems created by the Russian occupation authorities. Uh, and I think that's quite an interesting, sort of almost new phenomenon that um, is worth researching. So there's a lot of material out there. It's just about interpretation um, that is always incredibly difficult and trying to fill in these gaps that we don't really know about. Okay, we're getting close to the ending time and we want to be sensitive to our panelists' time, but I want to give Tatiana a chance to speak on this question and we'll give you the, the last word here and then we'll have a couple closing remarks. Yeah, thank you. Very briefly, um, on my sources, I followed social media, I followed uh, particular Telegram uh, channels and I also followed various um, internet media and i must say during the first months of the full scale invasion there, there was a, a lot of uh, reports actually from the occupied areas published in russian uh, independent independent media and uh, by um, foreign media where russian journalists were working for uh, bbc for example or reuters and and sources like that and of course it's uh, it's Far from um, what what we need to assess uh, fully the situation, but still it was very helpful. I had my own uh, also like personal contacts and and um, professional contacts. I must say um, now um, I know Ukrainian colleagues who are doing now research uh, in the deoccupied areas, interviewing people, um, doing focus groups in the deoccupied communities. I will, uh, I think it will be very interesting to listen and to to read what they did, and I think the the ethical issues because there was a question about ethical issues. Is is how how you interview people, how you talk to people who had this experience. I think there are two uh, 
so to say, two issues. One is re-traumatization, how to talk pe to people without kind of um, hurting them with with um, forcing them to remember these things. And second, like endangering uh, people who can be still having relatives or family on the occupied territories and being very conscious and cautious yeah. about kind of um, uh, yeah, not to, not to harm um, members of of the family of these people. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Tatjana. Thanks. Uh, I want to uh, close now by just thanking uh, thanking all of you in the audience for joining us here today. With apologies that we weren't able to get to all of the questions, we ran out of time, but we thank you for spending some of your time with us. I want to thank our excellent panelists. This is not the easiest topic to talk about, um, and we really appreciate them taking time today to share their expertise with us. I know I've learned an, an incredible amount from this, and I hope you have as well. I also wanted to just let everybody know that we will be back in April with the next installment of the New York City Russian Public Policy Series. That will be on April 17th. And following up from the discussion uh, that was in some of the remarks here about the upcoming elections, that will be a sort of um, retrospective on what comes next after the elections. And, um, and we've gone out on a limb and predicted the outcome of it by titling it tentatively Putin's fifth term, uh, the regime's evolution and future challenges. So we'll be back again April 17th at, at 12 o'clock. We hope to see many of you with us then. Thank you all once again for joining us today. Thanks so much to our panelists and thanks to Elise uh, for co-hosting and thanks for the Harriman uh, Institute and to Sasha at the Jordan Center for uh, providing support and Anton for all the work he does to get all of this organized. Thanks, everybody. Thanks all. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Oh, whoops. March 6th. <laughs> Jumped ahead. March 6th will be the next one. <laughs>